Hi, this is Paul. I've been mostly posting stuff I made before the weekend on my channel because I've been busy. Uh, this is COVID-19 pastoring. Uh, the church was closed on someone on Sunday. Someone, uh, a friend of mine, made a remark on Twitter about how all the pastors were happy because they didn't have church. Well, actually, uh, a lot of pastors have been a, <laughs> have been quite busy because, on one hand, canceling church doesn't mean canceling the sermon, especially not in my case. And actually there's just a lot of things that we have to do. Sunday mornings are simply a great time, especially in a small church, for a pastor to just make contact with most of the people of the church to see how they're looking, see how they're feeling, even just that handshake at the end of the service. That's a really important time. And then there's always a half dozen or so or maybe a dozen smallish conversations and then one or two large conversations. That's pretty normal for a small church pastor's morning on a Sunday morning. And without all that, it's really hard to keep track with, to keep um, to keep on track with people and to kind of sense how they're doing, where there are needs, so on and so forth. A lot of that stuff just sort of happens normally in the context of a gathering. And when you don't have gathering, you don't have these things. So I thought I would add to my usual uh, videos. Now, as those of you who've been following my channel know that my videos are sort of a dip into my stream of consciousness. And so, yeah, COVID-19 has changed a lot of our streams of consciousness and reoriented what we're talking about, who we're talking to. Um, I've now got three of my adult children living in my home, uh, two of them come back from college early. One had been living in my home, another one lives in Sacramento, another one lives across the country. So keeping touch with them, getting all the family chat and messaging things going, everybody's sort of staying at home, schools have been closed, graduate schools closed, all of that stuff. So that's, that's the way things are going to be for a while. And of course, California has had a high number of cases, so they've acted proactively, which I agree with, and things are quite shut down. Now, one of the things that I've noticed just growing older, I don't keep a journal or a diary or anything. Um, sometimes you don't get a second chance to remember something. What is so clear and vivid for us today, the experience we have today, tomorrow will be so completely different. That's very much true in the case of events like these. Um, I remember on 9-11, thinking the world will never be the same again. And that's always true, and it sort of isn't. So it's helpful to keep a little record of what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, so on and so forth. And again, for years, people have done this via diaries. And I guess in some ways, this is sort of a diary for me. Um, I've been watching some of the other channels that I usually watch, John Verveke's channel, Rebel Wisdom. Of course, Jordan Peterson hasn't made anything for a while. And, but actually, a lot of my media consumption have been has been covered COVID nineteen things, and I'll share at least one of the sources that I've been using for that. But it's what this what a disruption like this does. I remember some of those early Verveke lectures on shamans and how, in a sense, part of what they do is disrupt their normal sense making pattern receiving mechanisms in order to see the world in a different way. And I think that's exactly what the COVID-19 is doing to a lot of people now. We're seeing the world in a different way. And I think we should take advantage of this opportunity and pay attention to what we're noticing and learning from it. Another takeaway from John Verveke's work for me has been that wisdom is not just set things that we find and lay down, but wisdom processing um, learning to create wisdom as we go and create new wisdom. So uh, it's, this is a good time for gaining wisdom. Now, I've always been sort of a news junkie. In fact, in high school, they had a, I was not valedictorian of my class, but I remember that they had a, a contest on, on news. And I remember winning the contest, which I think shocked some of the other people in my class because you know, I didn't always have the top grades in the class, but um, I've always been a news junkie and I've always been an auditory learner and I always remember what I hear a lot better than what I read. Well, I remember just not too long ago, 
See, I didn't look up the date. See, this is how things go by. We had a church potluck, I think it was in January, February, and news was just starting to come out of China about this coronavirus. And um, uh, I'll just mention his first name. Rick mentioned to me, he says, you know, is this, uh, is this coronavirus going to be a big deal or not a big deal? And I said, you know, on one hand, with this stuff, it's not a matter of if, but when. So at some point, we're going to have another big virus and a pandemic. Could it be this one? Could it not be this one? We had SARS. We've had swine flu. We've had a variety of things. So really hard to tell. Time will tell. But And then once you start looking back, you see this journal article from 2007. The presence of a large reservoir of SARS-CoV-2. Um, coronavirus-like viruses in horseshoe bats together with the culture of eating exotic mammals in southern China is a time bomb. Well, time bomb went off just 13 years after that message went out. Now, I mentioned my preferred source right now for this outbreak has been a YouTube channel. His channel has grown dramatically, and may it grow more. I find his updates to be really helpful. A guy named Dr. John Campbell. Now, he's not a medical doctor, I don't think. He's a he's a nurse. He's got a PhD in something, but I love his channel, and it's sort of obviously a lot bigger than my channel, but he, he doesn't make beautiful videos. He makes videos the way he can make videos, and I just get a sense of here's a guy who's got some wisdom, and he shares it, and every day he gives us 20 or 40 minutes of something and goes through some of the numbers someday, goes through some basic things about it, and I've been watching um, most of his videos or videos pretty much every day since then. And, and again, to me, this this gets into the media question. Some of the stuff Jordan Peterson was noting is that, you know, mass media, the day of mass media, on well, the day doesn't, it's, it's like this way with a lot of these technological disruptions. Newspapers don't go away. They get downshifted and changed. Mass media isn't going away. It's changing. And so I find some of the most, look, I just touched my face. Now I think about that all the time. So the most helpful information I can find, I find on YouTube and other social media. Um, is, but this this really raises, well, okay, I, I know what's coming in my video and sometimes I jump into it and that's why I make my slides to kind of slow me down so I don't skip over things I want to say. So I started following uh, Dr. John Campbell's YouTube channel. I'll put the link in the notes here. His YouTube channel before I went down to Arizona and Southern California for the first leg of the tour with, with, um, with Job and John and Rod was with us. And we were all sort of watching this unfolding, and we were talking about it, and Job was keeping tracks of his, track of his conference and noting all of the cancellations, and we're beginning to wonder when we go to these meetings, are, are these meetings a good idea? All that stuff was running around in my head. We talked about it quite a bit, but we decided to take things a day at a time and not cancel the second leg if and when we would need to at this point. I'm, I'm glad we did. But, but this raises all of the issues of signal watching. How are we supposed to know the truth? How are we supposed to know? One of the things that you'll notice is the, the way political narratives continue to infect the news stream. And, and that's been very obvious in this, on, on both the right and the left. Um, you know, any chance, if you hate Trump, any chance you get a you get to, to knock the guy, they're going to take it. And the other side, well, you know, they're just trying to destroy, I remember a, a, a cousin of mine, you know, they're just trying to destroy Trump's economy and this is all fake news, blah, 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 blah. Um, there's responsibility and, and I should perhaps weigh that more carefully. But, you know, in a sense, a YouTube channel is just a YouTube channel and... I get lots of stuff wrong, but we all have, we're all watching signals and we're all watching signals from each other. And the ways we weigh these signals are, are far more complex than, than often what we realize. And, and so, you know, what became clear to me, at least watching John Campbell was what was coming and what, and what needed to happen. And so in a lot of ways, what we're doing with the signal watching is we're always weighing these signals. And we're, well, this guy said something and it came true. So I'm going to weight that a little bit more. And these, these sources didn't give this enough information and on and on and on and on. This, this very much gets into the question of my, my last monologue video and that I, when I was talking about, you know, being not sure. 
and a lot of the skepticism. And on one hand, skepticism is a really healthy thing because it, it affords us, and doubt is a healthy, healthy thing, because it affords us a chance to recalibrate our signal watching and our sense making and all of these things that we're doing. But even that recalibration is difficult because we don't really know what's coming. So I, I look at this entire virus thing as it's many things, but to me, it's a it can be a helpful experiment in knowing. Now, just yesterday, I be again because I was sort of following John Campbell, I kind of had a sense of what was coming. So I did my grocery shopping a little bit early, and I bought a little bit extra. I didn't I didn't buy any toilet paper; it was gone anyway. And when I went to Costco, I think Thursday last week. Uh, Costco had just gotten a new shipment of toilet paper and people were streaming out with toilet paper. And I thought, you know, it's not that kind of a bug, you know. It's, I don't know why, why toilet paper will be, a, will be a big issue. But now I've got five people in my house instead of the usual three people in my house. So uh, my wife put everybody on toilet paper rations. So um, but we'll, we'll get through this. So, so you wonder. Well, what's the truth? Are are they going to restock stores? Are are our food is our food supplies really adequate? Will this disrupt food supply chains here in the city? We rely on these supply chains for our food. You know, we haven't started our victory garden yet. Well, maybe we should, depending on just how long this thing goes. People start panic buying. Um, everything looks fine until it doesn't look fine. And I was just thinking this morning as I walked to the office how. You know, those of us who have been watching The Walking Dead and all these dystopian um, movies about about the end of the world probably have a sense of, well, you know, um, these are these things too are ringing in our heads and they're adjusting our our recalibrations for what is true and what is right and when should we act and 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 then suddenly the two you know our two you know, at least two natures come out that we have to to secure for ourselves and our family what we need or to be generous to others you know part of what we're dealing with right now is not knowing because i just paused the video because i had a little cough and i drank a little bit of water and i thought about the fact that well testing has been abysmal in the united states i don't know if i've got the infection i might i might be asymptomatic um, I hardly ever get sick. I, I, I suppose because I don't get sick, I have a strong immune system. I don't know. But how am I, how am I supposed to know if I'm asymptomatic? And, and then suddenly I think about all the seniors in my church and, well, I've stopped visiting hospitals. I've stopped visiting the nursing home. I'm not doing any house visits right now. I'm phoning people and calling them up and talking to them on the phone. But because that's usually the, the way that the seniors can be communicated with. But I don't know if I'm in asymptomatic. And so, you know, this makes me, again, recalibrate. People are like, well, science. Well, here's the thing about science. Science could now tell me if I have the virus or don't have the virus, but I don't have access to a kit. I don't have a fever. I don't really have a cough. You know, you just have the normal little coughing that you do if your throat's a little dry or something like that. It's sort of the height of allergy seasons here in Sacramento, and I've never had allergies, but as they say in Sacramento, if you didn't come with them, you'll get them here, and I've lived here 22 years, and so now I notice when pollen counts are really high, my eyes water a little bit, my nose runs a little bit, but all that is happening at the same time, so how can we know? I feel fine. Everything looks fine. Now suddenly we all become hypochondriacs. And every time we cough or hear someone else cough or sneeze, we look around. And I, w I was just thinking to myself when I, I went to the supermarket yesterday, which I've sort of been staying out of things, but there are a couple things we needed. And I, I told my wife, I said, you know, it's probably good if we do just sort of check in in the supermarket every now and then just to see what the way things are going and so on and so forth. But then there were huge lines and I wound up in a line. And so then you start looking around and then you start making, I find myself, my consciousness Congress making judgments about people. And if someone looks, you know, if they looks a little... If they look, you know, homeless or sketchy or ill or or something like that, you think, oh, I better stay away from them because because they're sick for sure. Then you look so, a lot at someone who's well dressed and, you know, all these biases that we have and all these filters that we have. We think, well, they must be healthy because they look good. Well, look at the uh, uh, look at the wife of of Trudeau in in Canada. Lovely, healthy looking woman. Bang. She's got it. 
Um, now they're on the internet, all these lists of the stars who have tested positive, all these basketball players who have tested positive. If you see them in public, they look beautiful and at the, you know, in, in full fitness and health, but they're positive and, you know, I deal with the homeless all the time and they may or may not be, be carrying it. In fact, Billy's sleeping right outside the door right now. He's been quiet as a mouse. He hasn't coughed a he hasn't coughed a bit, so... But you have all these biases and all these filters and all these things go through your head. And so this is a terrific experiment in knowing if you can sort of transcend yourself a little bit and watch yourself in terms of, now, what is going into my sense-making filters right now? And, and what signals am I picking up? And, and am I weighing them against other aspects of, of, of what I know and how I know these things. So it's it's one grand experiment in epistemology if we if we take the time to to check it out. And you know there's there's always nat there's always narrative and data and and you always need narrative and data. Data is senseless, meaningless without narrative, and narrative goes off track without data. And so we're always checking our narratives with our data, or we should be checking our narratives with our data, because we need narrative to navigate for today and then especially into tomorrow, because it's on the basis of all of these patterns that we've received that we anticipate the events to come and by which we plan for tomorrow. This That's why we have narratives. We can't be without narratives. And so my complaints about a lot of the, I don't want to use mainstream news, but that's sort of what it is. The mass media news is that it's, it's, it's sort of become too corrupted with data. And again, part of that is because of the mass market because you have to approximate so much when you're talking to so many people and and that gets into how you message and so the, that's why getting that's why in many of for many of us our filters are reshaped by well here's a person that I know personally and trust we just have so much more data on them that alters our narrative for them or if we look at reputations in society. There might be news sources that you trust more than other news sources, again, because of your narratives and how you're always fitting the da data and the narratives together. And we're, we're constantly doing these things. We need data to qualify or disqualify narratives. And so we're always doing that. And so this is why when I'm talking about the deconstruction of Rat and Link and others, I, I think Christians are way too hard on these people because they're they're working on their narrative and their data. And instead of just complaining about people and their deconstructions, we should come up alongside and participate with them in their data gathering and, and maybe subtly ask questions about certain assumptions that are moving the narrative and and certain elements of data that are changing the narrative. And so this this is sort of how I always deal with with my experiments and knowing. And again, for me, this whole virus thing is, well, I'll talk about the anxiety later, but but for me, it's really rather fun because I've got this huge experiment in narrative and data that I'm that I'm constantly going through right now. And in a sense, when we watch The Walking Dead or read a book or look at a movie or something like that, it, sort of what we're doing is we're playing with different narratives and we're playing with our data and we're, we're that's how we learn from these things between the narrative and the data. So now we've kind of got a, a, a live action there. I just touched my face again. See, now I'm thinking about my face. I don't touch your face. Don't touch your face. We've got all of these, this narrative and data things going on all the time. It's a constant process. And so take advantage of this thing right now. Some of you are going to have way more free time than you usually have. Ponder these things, gain wisdom, learn, try to figure out your narrative and your data points and, and continue to readjust what you assume to be the truth by virtue of the data and the narrative that you're receiving. Events like this have the potential, and again, we don't know yet, but events like this have the potential of radically shaping politics, society, religion, all of that. I fully expect if there are a lot, if there's a large loss of life with this pandemic, this will continue to reshape the church. Um, it will it will heighten religious conversations. Now, I've been reading, and I didn't put in a slide. I've been reading Ross Douthitz. I'm trying to say his name correctly. Douthitz, um, book on 
book on oh no i can't think about it it's so often it got, when i make a video and I, I just get this mental block when i'm when i'm trying to think of it um i'm gonna pause and pull it up Roch that ross dalthitz the decadent society i've been loving this book i'm almost done with it when i'm done with it i'm gonna go back and listen to it again because i'm doing the audiobook right now and i i on the basis of the audiobook because i have a subscription then i I picked up the Kindle version, and I'm going to be marking it up and going through it because I think it's a terrific book. And uh, I've, so I've got this book roaming around in my head while the grand COVID sense-making experiment is happening and, and while I'm getting new perspectives on pastoring. And it's just this kind of thinking that I find just simply so helpful and so productive in, in so many ways. So don't, don't let this experiment pass you by. And I think about Jordan Peterson talking about, you know, the question of religion. Well, what what is your religion? Well, this is this is a chance where a lot of people's religions will get recalibrated and readjusted because it's a radical sense-making change for our society. Or it has the potential of being. 9-11 did that. Again, depending on what happens here, this is going to 9-11, for, for many of us, we watched it on screens and, and, and certain things happened. But, but because this is rolling out so broadly, it's, it's going to have the, the opportunity to really adjust the sense-making apparatus of a whole lot of people. I haven't yet watched the, I saw that um, Rebel Wisdom did a sense-making video on this and I haven't I haven't watched that one yet, but I, like I said, I've been busy with with people and with things, and I, I I sort of expect that once we get down, and I'll talk about phases soon. Once we get down into, in a sense, the 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 new normal, um, I'll have more time to make videos and do conversations and all of that. So so we'll see. But again, in 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 moments, what I often tell people as a pastor, when something big has happened, when they've gotten a cancer diagnosis or there's been a car accident or um, uh, the revelation of a betrayal or a divorce, or I always tell them, don't make big decisions now. Take your time because tomorrow the world may look very different than it looks like today. And, and many of us have been in a period like that where from one day to the next, the world changes dramatically. Well, does the world change? Well, sometimes it does like now, but your perception of the world changes dramatically. Your narrative and your data change dramatically. So take your time right now and in terms of don't make big decisions, just take your time, pay a lot of attention, do a lot of thinking as, as, as you sort of move through the world right now. And, and as Jordan Peterson says, what, what you really believe is what you're going to act on. And what that will be for a lot of people is, are, is a revelation. When they, when they go into a store and they see the shelves empty, they might find themselves grabbing things. Okay, now do a little self-transcendence. Pause, watch yourself grab those things and say, what am I living out? What is my real religion? What is the religion I want to have? What is the person I want to be? And we as human beings have this, you know, my dog has very little, you know, live in the moment. My dog always lives in the moment. You know, he doesn't have any inhibition. Human beings have this capacity for inhibition, this capacity to, and again, I think about some of John Verveke's later videos, a, a second self, a I'm going to get into this second self business, but this an aspirational second self and say, what kind of person do I want to be? Bring up the rest of the capacities you have in your mind. Um, gain wisdom. Do all of this right now because there are huge opportunities for it. And and what's really cool about this is when sometimes, let's say something tragic or even something good, you get a new job, you fall in love for the first time, you have a new spouse, that changes your perceptions. Well, now we're all sort of going through this together, so talk to other people about it. And so I'm encouraging the people in my church to pick up the phone a lot because a lot of them are older and they're not necessarily, they don't have smartphones. And if they do have smartphones, they don't use them for all the smartphone stuff that's on it. So message each other, talk to each other, talk to one another, take this time to, to talk to the other people that you're sharing your home with and, and, and do all of this for gaining wisdom. You know, there's a picture in your mind of the real world well, we'll act on that picture in a sense with your aspirational second self. 
well, we want to act on science. We'll use science. But again, what you're going to notice is that if you say, I'm only going to know what science tells us, man, you, you very quickly are going to find yourself in a very thin world because, well, science might be able to tell you something about what's going on now. Uh, you don't have time to do the science of how many coronaviruses are laying around your desk. And, and just see, right now, very quickly, science will say, well, apply this cleaner to this surfacer for a certain number of minutes and you'll very quickly, combinatorial explosion, be overwhelmed in terms of what you can know. And every time you see someone, you can't use science to go out and know who you're going to talk to and who you can't talk to and is six feet far enough in this case or that case. And then they sneeze. Science won't tell you whether or not they sneeze. Not science could tell you whether or not you're positive right now, but you can't get a test right now. So what you're going to go back on is all of these other sense-making things, and you should be critical and critique these sense-making things. But again, when called upon to act, you make your best guess. You act. You you try to do the right thing with, with what you've got. Do you really know? Well, no, but you're going to have to go with, you're going to have to know with what you got. You'll, you'll hear right now a lot, at least from some of the people on TV, um, data-driven. This is data-driven, but data always tells you about the past. And now the past is really important data because we can look at patterns and and the patterns of the past will give us indication of the patterns in the future. But already now that the United States is adjusting things, there's, there's no data intricate enough to tell you everything. And this is the funny thing about statistics, because again, statistics are tremendously helpful in, in telling us things. And, and they might nail the statistics, or at least someone out there will nail the statistics about certain numbers of people will get sick, and, and these are the risk factors, and on and on and on. What the statistic won't tell you is what will happen to you, because you don't know where you are on that statistical line. And so, well, this is this is what people are working through all the time. Well, where am I? Well, these are the risk factors. The doctor will say, well, these are the factors for you, but you could be an outlier or you could be the majority. A lot of young people are saying, well, I've heard that generally speaking, young people don't get it too badly. That's true. But if you look at the data, you'll find some young people have died from it already. So that's where statistics break down. All of this data-driven stuff is really helpful, but again, it always has its limits. Now, church responses have been interesting to watch too. You know, first there was a lot of posturing churches, people remembering in the plagues, Christians didn't, well, run out of the villages. Well, some Christians didn't run out of the villages, others did. But then you should not necessarily just rely on posturing, but ask yourself, why did Christians not abandon their family and friends and even their enemies when plagues came? Well, because they had faith in the resurrection. And again, this is where the sense-making stuff and the religious stuff begins to come online. Because if you have a belief in the resurrection, it affords you to do, well, it, it's part of your sense making and it changes how you think you should act. But then you get to the question, do I really believe in the resurrection? Well, then maybe your actions are going to betray, betray you. Do I aspire to believe in the resurrection? Because as, I, may, as the, I preached a couple of weeks ago when I was preaching, Nicodemus was the text and Nicodemus gets into Numbers 21. You can go back and look at the rough draft or if you can go to the church. I'll put a link to the church sermon on the... Um, in the notes here. But, you know, it's very interesting because a lot of, I hear a lot of people, I talked to one person and, you know, it was a few days ago and, you know, greeting. I said, well, I should keep your distance because she's a person who, if she gets this, it will kill her. She says, I don't worry about that. I've got God. And I thought, oh, okay. Um, but here's the thing with Christianity. Um, Jesus not only had God, Jesus was God, and he was the one up on a cross. And that's a big part of the point of Christianity, because, again, reading all those Tom Holland books, that sort of the ancient understanding of God was, well, he's kind of the sum total of everything that happens, and if something happens, it was God's will by default. Well, that's a, that's a pretty rough thing to go with, but... 
it's sort of like saying, well, if something happens, it was your will. Well, we're not omnipotent, so... But very quickly, it gets into the point that, well, if, if everything that happens is God's will, we can pretty quickly decide who God favors and who God does not. And therefore, political losers are the ones that God doesn't favor, but political winners are the ones that God does favor. Now, if you switch that from monotheism to the metadivine realm, well, you'll have the gods, and that'll complexify the economy a little bit. But but, you know, the Hebrew scriptures got on this right away when it came to something like the book of Job, because the book of Job begins with, well, God and and the accuser and Satan are having this conversation. And God says, have you considered my servant Job? And if Job had known that and what would come, Job probably would have said, um, would you mind considering someone else, please? And because then Satan says, well, yeah, I don't, that's because, that's because, righteousness pays it's basically karma and god says all right take away his stuff let's see how he acts so so right away in the book of job the 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 whole easy math of good fortune equals favor with god gets disrupted and it gets massively disrupted with jesus crucifixion because well the mocking that goes on with Jesus, he saved others, he can't save himself, that gets completely disrupted with what happens with Christianity. And this is why Tom's ho Tom Holland's observation, and Tom Holland isn't the only person to make this observation, but, but, but this is why the crucifixion of Jesus just changes the world, because the basic equation and assumption upon which mental divine math is made gets completely disrupted. And I think this is part of the reason, I think, I'm going to have to think about this up, this opens up the enlightenment to, to sort of put away all of this ancient divine thinking. Well, well, then suddenly it's, it's, it's what? It's, it's without purpose. Well, that's not necessarily too far from some Eastern conceptualizations, but all the way back to the point that I started this slide with, Christians who say, well, I can't get the virus because I have Jesus, well, should think about Jesus hanging on the cross. Because the message of the crucifixion is that these kinds of simplistic equations are not Christian. Okay? Christians, yeah, Christians didn't flee the plague. And for the most part, what that meant was Christians died with everyone else. And... As a pastor, I'm amazed how often this doesn't this message doesn't get through. Now, there are some reasons for that, and part of the reasons for that are, in fact, the the span of the Bible. Um, I, in fact, for our council meeting last Thursday night, read, read Psalm 91. It's a beautiful psalm that gives a tremendous amount of comfort. That basically says our lives are in God's hand, and God loves us. But when we take the next jump of, therefore, no harm will happen to me, you've got to, again, look back at Jesus and say, no, harm happened to him. Now, he also was risen from the dead. And when I make this point to people, say, yeah, but you'd have to believe he was risen from the dead. Yeah, you would. That's a big part of the equation. And, and that's why attempts to sort of demythologize Jesus' resurrection and make it purely symbolic to me just don't do it for me because well jesus went to the cross believing he would rise from the dead isn't much different from sticking with the sick people believing you'll rise from the dead in fact if you're a christian you have more evidence for it if you believe that the story of jesus and the church and the apostles is evidence for the resurrection of the dead which i do so that should be something that Christians should talk about. That, well, what Christians, the the confidence that Christians have and the courage that Christians have is not, it's not irresponsible because of the historicity of the resurrection. And that's what I believe. So don't mean, it doesn't mean you won't get sick. And again, see the sermon where so the Israelites are complaining about the food and water and they murmur against Moses and against God. And so then 
God sends snakes. And then they're not murmuring about the food and the water anymore. They're murmuring about, they're complaining about the snakes. And they say, Moses, go tell God to get rid of the snakes. And so Moses goes to tell God to get rid of the snakes. And God doesn't get rid of the snakes. He says, set up a pole with a snake on it. And everyone who sees that will live. Okay. But think that through. It doesn't mean that, well, once you have the pole up, the snakes go away. And it doesn't mean that the snakes just go away. And it doesn't mean that the food and water get better. It just means that those who still get bit by the snake still get sick, but just don't die. And that's the illustration Jesus uses with Nicodemus. And it wasn't until I walked through this, walked through this lesson with my Sunday school class, and I should put the links to that in the notes now too, I hope I remember. Again, you can find that on my church channel. It's not until you walk through those links and you and it's not until I was walking through the through the story slowly like I was with my Sunday school class that I really paid enough attention that you can't understand John 3:16 without appreciating John 3:14. And that really addresses in many ways for me the question of the problem of evil. Now somebody in one of my comments on the sermons made the point, well, are you happy with everything that God does? I'm a Calvinist. No. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. <laughs> and if you think the people of God are always happy with what God does, you haven't read the Bible. Read the Psalms. There's a lot of complaining in the Psalms. And by virtue of the testimony of the Psalms, Numbers 21 notwithstanding, God doesn't seem to mind our challenges to him. I think if in a sense done in a right way, and so I'm not going to get into right now the question of well, why is complaining against God and Moses bad in Numbers 21 and why isn't it in the Psalms? That's a good question and many have answered it. Again, I think my favorite Tim Keller book is his book on on suffering now i have to remember to put that in the notes below so if i don't remember to put it in the below leave a comment in the leave a question in the comments and somebody else or maybe i will drop a link in but you know these are the issues and and i fully appreciate the fact that if you've been following my videos and following what i'm saying about us thinking about god and what god is you know, some Calvinist ideas may come into your head. Well, it shouldn't be a surprise. I'm a Calvinist minister. Well, well, does that mean that, well, that God always gives us the things that we want? No. Does that mean God is nice? No. God, the fruit of the Spirit, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I miss them. Love, patience, goodness, kindness. I say, now I can't do them because I'm thinking about it. But but read the, read the, um, read the list in the book of Galatians. Kindness sometimes, but kindness and strength together. And so we live in this world of pandemics, and I think we can be tremendously grateful we haven't had one for a hundred years. But again, don't be a, don't be fooled by the kind of world that we live in. But also take this other equation into effect, to account, and say don't simplistically just see. I think this is part of the problem with pantheism. Is that, well, here's God as such. No, the Bible says it's way more difficult than that. And it's probably not something we'll ever be smart enough to figure out. And so faith and trust. And I know that's problematic. And again, go back to all the earlier stuff I said in this video about doubt and recalibration and narrative and data and all of this stuff. All of that stuff is true. But to me, all of this stuff is true too. Oh, now I got to. So church response, you have to ask what is in the best interest of your people that, you know, you got legality coming in now that we were getting some bans and that's kind of making things a little bit easier. But best interest of your people, again, is in itself a very complex thing because there's a cruel irony because part of the reason that we suspended services last week for a week, because I said to the council, I said, we don't know what the next week's going to bring. So let's just do one week. We can always extend. We can always, we can always shut it down for more after because we don't know what's going on because don't make big decisions yet because 
things are, you know, patterns are disrupted right now. But I knew that if we didn't cancel church, some of the people most vulnerable to this illness were all the, also the people who would come to church because they come every week. Because, you know, people look at the percentage of older people in church right now and say, ah, it's a dying thing. I don't think that's the whole story. I think a lot of people start going to church in their older years because they're thinking about death. And death becomes a real thing for them because they've been doing some sense-making over the long haul and been able to appreciate things they didn't appreciate when they were younger. Now, now maybe not the same patterns of people coming back to church in, in later years will hold as been in past years. We don't know that. But there's a real correlation between church attendance and age, partly because at that point in your life, you begin to do some reflecting on your life and some of your assumptions about what is important changes. And so for many of the people who come into church or come into Coffee Break, which is our women's Bible study ministry, they never miss a week because these things are really important to them. Many of these people are widows and, and this is a major and important social outlet for them. So we closed, we canceled services because I pretty much feared that was the only way to keep them out. And in fact, myself and an elder and, and another, and Rick were here Sunday morning and no one came. And as someone noted on Twitter, huge irony for us that now successfully being a pastor this week was keeping everybody out of church instead of trying to get them into church. So there's a lot of balancing between needs and agendas that we're doing right now. And, and churches are doing a lot of this. Rod Dreer made a tweet that he fears that, you know, all this move to online church will, will keep people, will, will put people into the habit of, of not being in church on Sunday. I'm not as worried about that as he is. I think partly because of my, he can, he, he tends to, he's, he's a little further on the alarmist side than I am with a lot of things. I, I think that's part of a temperamental difference. But, but I think part of it is that you, you get something by being in a real live room and meeting. And I think actually what we're going to have with this, with the quarantines and with the isolation that we have is people are going to probably greater appreciate some of this. Again, all we're, we're in a position right now where the narrative and data is changing dramatically for people. So post-COVID-19 will be different from pre-COVID-19. We've passed something. It's a world event and the world will be different after this event in ways that we can somehow predict now and in ways that we can't. So churches are getting creative, and I was rather fortunate because doing videos with sermons on was pretty easy for me. I just could sit down and it, just do the routine. I've, I've been doing a lot of calling and finding out who has broadband and who doesn't have broadband and trying to, to deliver this to the people and been learning stuff, but churches are getting creative and learning stuff as they go. So, you know, I... There's always opportunities with these with these disruptions, and we should make the most of them. Partly because this could maybe not just be weeks, but months. We don't know. So we should prepare for the long haul. And again, encourage the elderly to stay home and people with, you know, you now, now the major news met networks have picked up on this. And I recommend keep watching John Campbell because so far, at least in terms of narrative and data, he's been ahead of the curve and I've really appreciated him. Check in on people, make phone calls, messaging, you know, do all of this as much as possible and, and, and help people with their support networks. Those of us who are younger or healthier should figure out how to support those who are older. Um, I'm going to be encouraging my deacons to, um, you know, to be active. And if I need to recruit some other volunteers from, from my meetup group, I'm going to, I'm not going to be shy about doing that too. And many of them have volunteered already. We don't know what we need yet. We're in early days of this thing. So... And the goal is, you know, in terms of my anxiety, well, I'll talk about that in a, in a slide coming up, but, you know, I think about my own mortality. I'm 57. Um, I don't have any of those underlying health risks. I'm a few pounds overweight, but I, I tend to think that, well, I'll get through this, but it could be that I won't. And, you know, 
I don't know if somebody will make a video to say, well, no more videos from Paul because Paul's not here anymore. Um, look for Paul at the resurrection of the dead. Uh, that might happen. That might not happen. But I won't. I won't. I won't kid you in that. You know, my wife said something to me last night that, you know, something along similar lines lines that she could go and, you know, we joke about that sometimes. And if you're married, you deal with that. But you know, then for a moment it struck me in a different way. And I looked at her and I said, you know, I'll be careful with those words, sweetheart, because because that would be a hard day. That'd be a hard day for me to lose you. People are looking at this right now. Um, my mother-in-law, my wife's my wife's mother, um, was born not too long after the 1920 pandemic, and you know lost a sister. If I look back on you know my the house of my great grandfather, he lost a child in that pandemic. It's not likely against statistics, but my children aren't statistics to me. I could lose a child in this. I remember I remember asking a room full of Haitians when I was a missionary in the Dominican Republic, how many of you have ever lost a child? Everyone raised their hand. We're not used to that in North America. That that adjusts that adjusts our sense making apparatus. It changes us. So check in with people, value people. Uh, my mother's now up in years. Uh, my sister has some is a little older than I am. Has some underlying health problems. They're on the other side of the continent. If if they die, how long will it be until I can get there? You know, some of the word, some of the messages coming out of Italy. Uh, using churches as morgues, and when I, you know, I'm in my office, I can get here. There's almost never anybody else here, so it's about as isolated. It's actually less. It's more isolated than my house with four other people in it now. But I think about when I heard that, I thought about what if there were, you know, body bags lined up at Living Stones. And I think about some of the members of my church. What if I would do her funeral or his funeral? What am I going to say? When can the funerals be held? There's, this, is, this is getting serious for a lot of people. And that seriousness is going to increase their anxiety. I mean, with the deacons, it was like, you know, one of the things the deacons said almost right away, they said, you know, if we're not taking those Sunday offerings faster, yeah, that's true. So, but don't, you know, the church... The church, the church isn't at zero in the bank. Um, church has some buffer, so praise God for that. But, um, you know, how long will this go? What will the long-term things be if certain people don't make it in the church? You know, 20% of the church gives 80% of the money. If we lose many more of those 20 percenters, you know, might have to be other readjustments. We don't know. So we start getting creative. Now, one of the things that I've noted is this was a picture I took on my way to work to get today. Noticed that not only is it garbage day and they're picking up the garbage, but there are a lot more cars parked on the street during business hours right now. That means a lot of people are staying home. The, the traffic on Florin Road was less this morning. A lot of people are staying home. So there are phases that we go through with these disruptions. First, there's skepticism, and that's not... That's not a bad thing. Skepticism isn't bad because skepticism is part of our, you know, oh, okay, I'm not going to believe this strange news right away. I've got my narrative and I've got my data. I've got to I've got to figure out how they go together. So skepticism has its purpose. But and and people are going to be on a spectrum. Some people are always are going to be very skeptical. Other people are going to be early adopters. And again, as a society, that's actually a good function that we have. Then there's alarm. And alarm is important too. Now, panic, eh, now's not the time to panic. When is the time to panic? Alarm is a good thing. And I'm glad to see that, for the most part, in the United States, alarm is is what we are in or are just now getting beyond. So alarm, getting people uncomfortable enough to make change because change is uncomfortable. So alarm is a good thing. We need alarm. And then adjustment. Uh, figure out what changes you need to make. So 
that's also disquieting. It goes in there with alarm and then sustainability. How can we sustain the adjustments? So there's a new normal until the new new normal that we can't know yet. So these are sort of the phases. And now, so I'm in my 50s and, you know, in the Dominican Republic, when I was a missionary, we got more used to calamities like this. One of the things that you appreciate when you move back to the United States is just how stable everything is here. You know, we we, we tell time with clocks plugged into the power. We, we don't have cisterns and pumps at our houses because the water is always on for the most part. And so life is very stable and reliable and predictable here. But in the third world, not nearly so much. And so you get used to dealing with emergencies on a semi-regular basis. And so I noticed how many times in the developing world I go through these four phases. Skepticism, alarm, adjustment, sustainability, and just keep going through them. And we will go through them. These things are sort of fractal. They sort of scale as we go by. So again, use this opportunity to learn and to recalibrate and perfect your, your sense-making apparatus and retinker your narratives and you know, retinker where you get your information and listen and learn and, and do better one to another. And then there are the leftovers. So get to work this morning and there he is right there. Well, that pattern hasn't changed yet. I guess his drug dealer has been able to, you know, continue to keep getting him his drugs. And he, he asked me, actually, I was in on Saturday, which I'm usually not in. And he asked me, he said, can everyone go to your church? I said, yeah, you're welcome to come in on Sunday morning. And he seemed a little excited. I said, but we're not having church this week. <laughs> and it might be a few weeks, but he would probably still be here. I mean, those who understand, those who know the story of of Daniel and the foundation of the Lord know that that's like prime spot if you're homeless because the church has an overhang and all those bushes right to the left of them mean you can't see him from the street. So the gangs leave him alone, but you can, can pop up and see things that happen. And this guy's considerably cleaner than Daniel. Not terribly clean, but at least cleaner. And so, and he's very quiet. So, you know, but... But, you know, I was I was happy to see Gavin Newsom talk about the homeless in California. And, well, they'll, that'll be an issue. And there'll be way more surprises. They'll, society is very complex. And I get really annoyed listening to, to reporters. They're, they're doing their job. They have to ask all these questions. But they ask them so often in such a way that, you know, hey, government is, when government is functioning, they're doing... They're doing what they need to do, and society is really complex. And now reporters are doing what they need to do is sort of an irritation, but there's going to be a lot of leftovers through this. And there's going to be a lot of death anxiety. And so the last monologue I did, which, again, see, part of the reason I make these slides is because when I put a picture of something in, I remember to put the link in the notes. If I don't put a picture in, I don't remember to put the link in the notes. So if I'm missing links in the notes, let me know and I can put them into the comment section or other people can put them into the comment section. But a lot of people are anxious. And especially when you go back into the um, into the alarm and adjustment phases, anxiety's run high. And, you know, people who are, you know, higher in anxiety... This is harder on them. And people readjust their anxiety through watching and listening to other people. And now that we're going into a phase of a lot of isolation, that's going to cause a lot of things for people. People are going, I didn't see a lot of people stocking up on alcohol, but that's going to come. A lot of people are going to drink their way through this. A lot of people are going to do a lot of pot through this. A lot of people are going to watch a lot of Netflix, but Netflix only goes so far. People need each other to recalibrate but, but also people wind each other up. And not only with individuals do we need other people, but communities of people can get anxious and panic together. That's part of the panic buying we see. We not only, I mean, we scale inside just like we scale outside. And so these questions of, you know, death and God are going to be uh, really big in people's minds. And so... Yeah, this is an opportunity for churches. It, it really is. Um, and churches ought to be responsible and truthful with this opportunity, please. Because if you, if churches take advantage of people when they're anxious and alarmed, 
when the alarm is done and people realize they've been taken advantage of, you harm the cause. So be honest with people. Be truthful with people. Don't be mercenary. Please. Um, tell people the truth. Tell people what you think. Share with them your doubts. Share with them your anxiety. If you would imagine that nobody in church has anxiety, they'd be lying to you. Tell the truth. So we're going to see how well these mitigation strategies prevent loss of life in the USA. And, and again, I've been thinking about this in terms of my own health, health of my loved ones, health of my congregation. We don't know what things look like on the other side of this. So one day at a time. Um, a lot of people are not ready for death in our culture because they're unfamiliar with it. And... As a culture, we've lost a lot of our healthy practices surrounding death. Um, so, yeah, this is going to be a wake-up call for a lot of people on a lot of levels. Um, a lot of people have postponed questions about afterlife, and these questions will get more real. And, and that's a good thing, because, again, Jordan Peterson stuff, let's talk about these things. Talking is good. Talking is how we think communally. Let's talk about these things. Um, and so, you know, I'll have to figure out, I've been too busy. I haven't been on the discord server for a while. I haven't, we canceled our meetups. Um, I'm going to have to figure out how to open up channels again for conversations and, and, and we should, you know, again, I'll want some of it to be sort of random, like, a, like with my link, you know, everybody who's not had two conversations and some of them I'll have to. Um, plan, you know, might be good to listen to Burn in Georgia about this. Because, again, this is a worldwide thing. And maybe have a conversation with, with some people from the UK and some people from other parts of North America and, and Europe. So um, you will have to figure out how this goes. And a lot will depend on how long this goes. Now, I saw a news report that Singapore has sort of gotten back to normal already. They jumped on it quickly in a very coordinate, uh, coordinated way. Singapore is one city, which is already highly <laughs> communitarian, let's say. So, you know, that, that helps them in a crisis like this. The United States is a huge place with a huge population and a whole network of states and agencies. So it'll probably be messier in the United States. I am deeply concerned about what's going to happen in the third world with this virus. Because I don't know if, you know, the United States is going to be in a position to help a lot of countries. And I get the sense, this is by my own bias, that a lot of help that comes from China has strings attached. A lot of help that comes from the United States has strings attached. Missionary efforts. Um, a lot of help that comes from the United States comes from churches and missionary efforts and those might be hamstrung by this so yeah yeah there's a lot to be not sure about but when it comes to questions about the resurrection in my opinion not sure is not good enough so yeah first thoughts first video don't even know how long this took but i'm sure we'll be talking about this for a long time so take care of each other if you're a christian continue to be faithful in prayer it's a good time to have time and quiet to pray perhaps for some of you um, keep updating your narrative data dynamics and um, leave a comment in the comments get on the discord totally virus safe being on the discord if you wipe your keyboard down watch dr john campbell and um We'll see what the future of it brings. Thanks for watching.